The holiday season, it's a time of giving, a time when we are being asked to donate to all kinds of charities. But how much really goes to help? Our Rick DeBrill, DeBrill rather, has been looking into that, and tonight has the first in a series of reports we call the givers and the takers. Well, Ken, people are constantly being called at home. You have probably been called at home and asked to give or to buy tickets to some worthy cause. But you might be surprised to find out that a lot of the money you gave never reached the people you wanted to help. Take the Girls Ranch of Arizona, for example, a worthy tax-deductible charity that helps troubled girls. Its latest fundraising drive, a stunt show called Hollywood Comes to Arizona, produced by an outside company, James Comer Public Relations, a company that, along with its employees, will make money off of your willingness to give. How much? Action News went undercover to find out. We put a camera in a briefcase and asked employees of Cope Services, a charity watchdog organization in Glendale, to go in and apply for a job at Comer Public Relations. They answered the sign out front that says, Help Wanted, Cash Paid Daily. You guys are looking for a job. They've got experience. Inside, the pair was offered between 25 and 35 percent commission on every ticket they sold. 200 is better five days consecutive. Get you an extra 5% on the entire thousand or better for that five day period. A Comer employee, Bill Allison, also admitted he pays a collector 10% just to pick up the money. That means 35 to 45 percent of the money you gave is gone before the cost of the show, the expenses, or the company's profit is taken out. That's all money the girls' ranch will never get. What percentage of the money collected by James Comer Public Relations will go to the girls' ranch? Estimated. Okay, depending on the amount of funds raised totally, anywhere from 35 to 80 percent. 80 percent? If that type of funds are raised, 35 to 80 percent can go to the girls' ranch. Is that very likely that 80% will go? No. It comes down to the basic question, should when, when we're soliciting donations or anyone soliciting donations any time of the year, should they be told the percentage of, of administrative costs? Should they be told the, the percentage of fundraising costs? Comer Public Relations says its employees were well briefed and supervised to answer any questions. But at least one woman who called for Comer from her home disagreed. I had a lot of questions, but there wasn't any answers. He Like what? Well, I wanted to know, you know, how uh, I was to go about getting the receipts to these people, uh, how they would know, you know, how I would know when they paid, you know, my money would be turned in, um, how the proceeds were going to be distributed you know, directly to the ranch and stuff. And he she quit calling after one day. She said it just didn't sound right. And there is one other thing. The show is being put on and the money raised without a permit from or even the knowledge of the Phoenix Solicitation Board. The Girls Ranch's most recent request says money will be raised through mail solicitation and that no outside promoters like James Comer Public Relations will be used. Incidentally, the promoter is the one who is supposed to be filing for that permit. This is just one of the examples we have found during our investigation here in Phoenix. We'll be showing you more this week. But it raises some important questions. How much should it cost to raise a dollar? Should you be told that up front? Who should be policing this? And how do you know who is legitimate and who isn't? These are all questions that we will try to answer this week. One other thing, the Girls Ranch is a very legitimate charity. We're not saying do not give to the Girls Ranch, but you might be better off just writing a check and sending it to them directly. Kent, Linda? Thank you very much, Rick. Few people in Phoenix realize the city has a solicitation board, and even fewer know that it also has serious problems. Rick DeBrule has been looking at those problems as part of his report on the givers and the takers. Rick? Well, it's the solicitation board that has the right to grant or refuse charities a permit to ask you for money. But neither side seems happy with the job that's being done these days. Now, who's going to be making the actual solicitations to sell the tickets? The five-member board meets once a month, looking at requests and deciding which charity can go public looking for money. The idea behind the law is that if you're going to ask somebody to give money that's for the common good, that uh, the person being solicited will be more likely to give than if he's just buying a product. And so that if a person is asked to give for the common good, the person doing the asking should have a permit to ensure that that's what the money is really being used for. But it's a process that both sides say needs a major overhaul. The ordinance is very poorly drafted. The way the permits are granted is very arbitrary. 
Is the policing system good enough? No, it's not adequate at all. One of the board's main concerns these days is outside promoters raising funds on behalf of an organization. The organizations are taking five or ten percent of what's raised and the rest of the money's promoting of private business and I don't think the community's aware of it. So in other words, they're buying the ticket thinking a lot of this money is going to a charity when a lot of that money, a good portion of it, is going into the promoter's pocket. Often 85 to 90 cents out of the dollar. The stance that the solicitation board seems to take is you ought to volunteer your time to raise the funds for this organization. Gold, who raises money for charity, says it's a process that simply costs money. The reason that we do raise the funds for the organization is one, they don't have the time to raise the funds for themselves, or two, they don't have the expertise. But there is abuse. For example, the promoter who contacted Gompers Rehabilitation Center with a fundraising scheme. We sat in on the call. Okay, well, basically what we want to do is put together some Christmas baskets for um, the hungry. But in fact, only 40 cents out of every dollar was actually going to be used to feed the hungry. Do we have to get the permit to do this, or have you already gotten one? We don't have to do anything. We got a license and everything. Well, you you already licensed to do it through the city of Phoenix? Right. We checked. He has no permit. Person home gets a lot of phone calls, whether it be police organizations, charities, animals, kids, whatever it may be. Um, how many of those do you think are really legitimate and above board and telling everything organizations? I would say about uh, 25 percent. I'm sure that there's a tremendous amount of it going on out there that is never reported, where the people don't even realize what is happening to the funds that they are donating, uh, supposedly donating to these organizations. We have, have no way of knowing how much is actually going on. Uh, we do have enforcement powers, but we have very little resources for which to uh, uh, perform this duty, and there is no fixed procedure to follow up. Though. If someone is caught breaking the ordinance, it's a misdemeanor, a small fine, and possibly a short jail term. But nobody seems to be able to remember the last time that anyone was so much as charged, let alone convicted of something like that, even though our investigation shows that apparently it happens all the time. Incidentally, we contacted the police about that promoter, and he did not collect any money. This is the promoter on the phone, The not promoter Mr. that was Gold. on the phone, not Mr. Gold, right. right. Thank you. Next time you get a call asking you to give to a charity, you ought to ask some questions. Rick DeBruel has been looking into the way that money is raised this week. During a special report, we call the givers and the takers. And he says you might be surprised at what's happening. Well, Kent, what's happening is that it's getting harder for the charities out there to scramble for the few dollars that you have to give. And that has led to an increase in the number of promoters who raise money for charity. I wouldn't advise any charity to do it on their own, get professional people and get good legal counsel. Where does the organization turn to that is in dire need of the funds that aren't being, re that, that they, they, they can't get, that are being cut out from, from whatever, Washington? Where do they go to get the funds? A number of organizations have been turning to Stephen Gold, a promoter who specializes in raising money for charity. Gold's latest promotion is a magic show to help benefit the Phoenix Midtown Sertoma Club. It's a group that hopes to donate the proceeds to help the kids here at the Phoenix Day School for the Deaf. But the question is, how much of the money that you're paying for those tickets is actually going to end up back here? Because he's having to hire telephone solicitors, he is having to hire runners to go out and pick up the money, and so a great deal of the money goes to the professional promoter and his expenses. Very little of it finds its way to the charity involved. According to the disclosure statement Gold has filed with the Phoenix Solicitation Board, his show should raise $40,000. But after phone salesmen are paid, expenses are taken out, and Mr. Gold's profit is paid, barely more than 20% of the money taken in will be distributed to charity. Do you think in this case, the end of 22% going to the Phoenix State School for the Deaf, does that justify the means? Does that justify raising a dollar? Uh... I think to do it one time in this particular in, uh, instance, I think so, yes. And it's 100% legal because the Phoenix Solicitation Board has granted a permit. My personal man opinion is it's unreasonable. It's an unreasonable amount of money. Um, but we have, a, we have a pattern of enforcement uh, that's very difficult to devi deviate from at this point. Gold says his organization is one of the best run in Phoenix. And our investigation has backed that up. But even his company has problems. A recent fundraising drive for hypoglycemia, a struggling charity run out of the home of May Shoemaker, 
ended in a cease and desist order from the city. Not enough money was going to charity. To this day, we don't know how much money was raised in the two weeks they were fundraising for us. Do you know whatever happened to that money? I don't know what happened to that money. Gold says he did pay her a small amount. And a new drive for the Arizona Pet Line already has problems. A conversation recorded last week found a gold employee misrepresenting herself. What I can say about us, like for instance, anyone that's on the phone here, we are voluntary. In other words, we do get paid, but what we get paid is our traveling expenses. As an employee of Mr. Gold, that caller gets a percentage of everything she sells, not just her traveling expenses. And according to the city attorney's office, Gold is not even supposed to be soliciting yet because he does not have a permit. He's going up for that permit next month. Kent? What about the, the legal ramifications of, of saying something on the phone or in person that may not be true? If they're just soliciting, that all they, they need the permit, and that's only a misdemeanor. But if she's saying something to get your money that isn't true, and that's fraud, and that's, we're talking much more serious thing. What's the bottom line for the consumer? I'd say someone out there wants to donate some money to charity. We're going to really go into that in depth on Friday, but the first thing is pay attention. Treat it like you would an investment. Don't just give money out over the phone to anybody who calls you up. Look into it and find out whether or not they're a legitimate organization. We'll tell you some ways Friday you can find out. And will there be another report tomorrow? Of course. Thank you. The county attorney's office is trying to find people who donated money to the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association. It's part of a bigger problem the Valley has with phone solicitation. Rick DeBrule has more in his report, The Givers and the Takers. Well, Cheryl, all this week we've been talking about charities that ask you for money. Tonight the topic turns to police organizations. They call up a lot of people every day. They've probably called you up asking you to buy a ticket to a rodeo or a show. But instead of being some of the cleanest operations in town, our investigation has shown they have just as many problems. Just because they say this is for a police auxiliary does not mean it's a legitimate drive. Take the recent fundraising show put on by the Arizona Police League, the sounds of the 60s at Symphony Hall. Tickets were sold over the phone, but the salesman didn't always tell the truth. They identified themselves as the Arizona Police League, said the donation would be tax deductible. Okay. Did they say whether it was tax deductible or not? Yes, they did. They did say it was tax Yes, it was tax deductible. Do you remember whether they said it was tax deductible or not? I do believe they said it was. In fact, tickets to this show are not a tax deduction. Arizona Police League is a labor organization, not a charity. And that it was going to benefit basically the block watch program. Uh, in, then they were going to, of course, use it toward, uh, was it Crime Stop also program. But basically it was the block watch system itself. Individual members may support it, but block watch is a program within the police department. He identified himself as being an officer. He did? Uh-huh. What did he tell you? Um, and he told me that they had a benefit and if I'd be interested. And I asked him what it was and he told me. And I started laughing with him because I asked him if he was the same policeman that just gave me a ticket. <laughs> and he said uh, he hoped he wasn't. He wasn't because the caller was not a police officer. Officers are never used. Gordon Lang was the head of the Arizona Police League when all this happened. I can't physically be there. All we can do is tell the managers this is what we want set. Lang is still president of the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association, PLEA. Lang is under investigation for raising money by using the name of Silent Witness. All calls to Silent Witness are anonymous, and the Silent Witness phone is manned 24 hours every day. Our thrust is that we're calling up people on behalf of, of say, PLEA or the Arizona Police League, and you're supporting that organization. Now, when they ask what that organization does or activities it's involved in, then they get into all kinds of different areas that the organization does. But in fact, Lang later admitted that when the name Silent Witness was first used, no contribution had actually been made and wasn't until later. By the way, that contribution, a $250 check, was returned. Had you ever authorized them to solicit on behalf of, of Silent Witness? No, we have not authorized anybody to solicit on behalf of Silent Witness. Lang says he stopped using the name Silent Witness in late February. But according to the Silent Witness Board President, Lang was told to stop earlier. It was reported to us by uh, one of the uh, assistant chiefs that advises the Silent Witness program that the uh, plea organization had said it would no longer solicit on behalf of Silent Witness. That happened at the February 2nd meeting. But in a letter postmarked March 5th, Lang continued to use the Silent Witness name. As for the Arizona Police League, it is now headed by Steve Zimmerman. 
But recent phone calls recorded by Cope Services, a charity watchdog organization based in Glendale, show the league still has problems. Uh, I'm with the Arizona Police League, and the reason I called you is we're putting on our uh, annual Christmas party and variety show for all the uh, underprivileged kids and families here in the Valley. Uh -huh. I don't get nothing from whatever that they get in for this, for the Christmas party. Uh -huh. I don't have to get none of that. Okay. That goes straight towards the kids and for, for a needy family here. Once again, that caller does get a percentage of everything he sells. And if the Arizona Police League is raising money for charity, it needs a permit from the city, which it does not have. We talked with the APL president, Steve Zimmerman, recently. He would not go on camera, but he says he is trying to solve those problems. By the way, Plea is no longer in the phone business. They, I talked with one of the board members today. They said there were just too many problems, too many things they couldn't control. They could not control what the people were saying on the phone. Okay. Thank you very much, Rick. According to a recent national survey, nearly half of all Americans think a large chunk of the money they give to charity never makes it. But in his final report on the givers and the takers, Richter Brule has a few tips for people who want to make sure their dollars arrive. Right? Well, Linda, what it basically boils down to is treat charities like you would any other investment or purchase for that matter. Ask questions. I'll show you one last example where a lot of people weren't getting their money's worth. They paid $30 a piece to give Easter baskets to handicapped kids. What the basket consisted of was a little plastic basket with some donated items in it, uh, a few pieces of candy, balloon, and a whole bunch of Easter straw. And they did, in fact, supply these Easter baskets to the children that they said they were going to. The estimated value of all this? Less than two dollars. And people bought them over the phone without seeing them. Now think about that. You wouldn't buy a house that way. You wouldn't even buy a watch that way but a lot of people give to charity that way. I think in, in anything you invest your money in, and Girls Ranch is an investment. It's an investment in girls and in you know, the youth of the future. Um, you want to know where it's going and, and how it's being spent. And I think it, that's wise. How do you protect yourself? With the information in these files, solicitation permits. But since you probably don't have the time to find and read them, Call the Better Business Bureau. It does. So does Cope Services, a Glendale-based charity watchdog organization that puts out a monthly paper. Don't just rely on what you're told over the phone. What we are finding is that a lot of these people will outright not tell you the truth. What we suggest that you do uh, is, number one, either contact our organization or contact the Better Business Bureau. Well, our suggestion is that if you get a call at home, the first thing is to tell them that you do not give money by telephone or you won't write a check until you get some written material from the charity. Don't donate pure cash. It's a check or some way and demand a receipt. If nothing else, you need it for your IRS records, okay? If they say buy the ticket so some needy children can go, think twice. The kids can't always use them. Fact is, a lot of times we do get the tickets. We return them because a majority of our children uh, cannot attend those shows. The shows start at 8 o'clock. These kids are in bed by 8 o'clock. Their parents, both parents are usually working. Uh, they do not have the time, they do not oftentimes even have the transportation to take the kids to these uh, events. Uh, it's a ripoff. Find out how much of your dollar will actually make it to charity. What percent does it cost to raise the money? A good average is 25 percent, but it's up to you to decide what's appropriate. The other side of it is public, the donors' education. And I think we may come to a point where they have to say approximately such and such percentage of your dollar will go to the charity. Americans are people that want to help, okay? But that's also somewhat of a weakness because the con artist knows it and he's going to take advantage of it. So you've got to be careful today. As for who is hurt by all this, well, the children here at Gompers Rehabilitation Center are a good example. They're the handicapped, the sick, the poor, the people who truly need your help, but aren't always getting it. Photographer Steve Woodman and I have been working this story for most of this last month, and there's one thing we'd like to emphasize. Don't use any of what we have said as an excuse to stop giving. A lot of charities need your help now more than ever. Take a moment out, though, to ask those questions, or better yet, just pick a charity for this Christmas and give directly. Then you will know exactly who is getting your money and what they're doing with it in the long run. Linda? A lot of people are interested in giving it, especially during the holidays. Now, all of these tips are wonderful. Should they be applied to all different kinds of charities? You can apply charities? them to any charity, whether it's somebody who's calling on the phone for a phone solicitation, whether it's United Way, whoever it may be.
try and find out how much of your money is actually going to be going to help the people that you want to help. The more volunteers there are in an organization, the chances are the more money that's going to be going to help the kids or whoever it is you want to help. Thank you very much, both you and Steve. Well, sports is coming up next, and Bill Denny will have a pre preview of the Fiesta celebration. It all begins tonight with the Fiesta basketball game. Sports is coming up next, and Bill Denny will have a preview of the Sun Sixers game. Here at then Saturday and Sunday, mostly sunny and warmer. High Saturday, 68. High Sunday, around 70 degrees. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, mostly sunny and seasonal temperatures, which means a little bit warmer than what we've been having. Here's the other T-shirt. That Can you see it? North Phoenix Rotary Club patio sale, December the 4th and the 5th. It's going to be at DeVry Institute, sponsored by the North Phoenix Rotary. Going to be quite a nice event. You can that go out good. and get some patios. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Or garages for that. Or a garage, maybe. Coming up next on Action News, Rick DeBruel has some tips on how you can avoid being taken when you're giving. If you're looking for economical trucking, plain or fancy, we've got them. Fan Toyota trucks. Easy to buy and cheap to keep. Toyota dealers keep your Toyota cheap to keep. Easy riding, fuel efficient pickups. Truck tough, but real styling. 15 different Toyota truck models to choose from. For trucking, plain or fancy, we've got them. Easy to buy and cheap to keep at Van Toyota, 1500 East Camelback. Toyota cheap to keep. Are you ready for this one? Tomorrow, for one day and one day only, Appliance TV City shoots down prices on merchandise in every department. Save on TVs, appliances, audio equipment. Save on a Zenith 19-inch color portable, just $2.98. Save on a Litton Energy Saving Microwave, just $2.18. Save on a Sanyo AM FM Stereo Receiver, just $99. Tomorrow, Saturday only, at Appliance TV City. You can save with cash, check, or charge. A.G. Spanos Construction announces the grand opening of Desert Sands Village, featuring a two-story clubhouse complete with pool tables, saunas, whirlpool bath, and exercise room. Outdoor activities include three tennis courts and two swimming pools. This luxurious complex offers one, two, and three-bedroom units, each with washer-dryer hookups, and all this with the peace of mind of a 24-hour guarded gate security. This weekend only, save $600 at Desert Sands Village, 7th Street, and Bell. Excuse me, why do you go to Planned Parenthood? I go to Planned Parenthood for family planning services. For parent and teen programs. I went for a pregnancy test. Infertility. VD diagnosis. <laughs> I'm approaching menopause and I still go to Planned Parenthood. Two and a half million people turn to Planned Parenthood each year. For a wide range of medical, information and counseling services on reproductive health, call Planned Parenthood. It makes sense. <laughs> 